I thought I would end today by looking at a case study um, different than Burundi uh, and one that we're going to come back to in a couple of weeks. Uh, but when we're talking about the environment, uh, the environmental legacies of earlier decisions uh, and the risks of conflict and a case in which we actually don't see conflict, uh, given a lot of the characteristics that one would think would be a sufficient condition uh, of conflict, it is challenging our assumptions as to how uh, absolute and relative scarcity should be a driver of large-scale political instability. So I think it's useful to kind of see uh, the ways in which the instability has manifested, um, and the, the roles in which political decision makers can play in shaping the political and environmental um, and uh, economic outcomes uh, of a state and how that can change really quickly. Um, because I started today by talking about how, given the nature of the challenges facing the world system generally and individual states, um, the focus is often on understanding what is changing uh, and not what roles governments and uh, politicians uh, play in shaping outcomes uh, and what what level of an importance uh, political decisions uh, have for states' capacity to uh, respond to challenges um, and how they might view the challenges differently depending on where you are, what your interests are, and what your um, institutional legacies are. So Venezuela is a case uh, study of how a country um, that had incredible resources and revenues, uh, increasing spending on human development, can all go pear-shaped so quickly. So um, uh, a country in uh, Latin America, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of other Latin American countries in the class. It is um, not necessarily on the brink of economic col uh, collapse, I would say, arguably, in the last couple of years. It basically uh, has given the state of a large percentage of the population and the lack of the government's ability to respond to people's needs in the most basic manners that the social contract would expect in exchange for giving up liberty, you do get some kind of um, uh, security and uh, property rights and, and personal um, humanitarian rights. Um, this is not to say that these things don't ebb and flow. Um, after the recent election, uh, over 50 countries have uh, supported the uh, challenger who they say won uh, the election um, recently traveled to the United States, but by and large, Nicolas Maduro, the current president, is still there and has um, solidified uh, control, at least for now, even though uh, the COVID crisis is still ongoing. The Another reason to talk about the Venezuelan crisis is how different crises and difficulties in certain countries get more broad-based attention research-wise, like Burundi, uh, not so much compared to its neighbor Rwanda. Um, Venezuela doesn't get as much attention uh, and humanitarian need, uh, the refugee uh, crisis that's ongoing there compared to Syria. Um, this is a quote from, from last year, but by and large the same trends holds that um, now, of course, the number of people display, uh, displaced in uh, Venezuela estimates are over four and a half million people. Um, Venezuela is the second largest refugee crisis after Syria, but they haven't received nearly as much help from the international community. Spending in, on uh, Syrians peaked at more than $5,000 US dollars per displaced person, uh, while Venezuela has received less than a tenth of that, over three, only $300. Uh, per person, and uh, an appeal to the United Nations uh, netted less than a quarter of its goals. And the reasons for this could be myriad. You're, you're free to discuss them in the, in the workshop. But I would uh, argue that some part of it does have uh, to do with the political decisions made by its leadership over the last 15 years and the role that the United States plays in trying to implement and maintain sanctions against the Venezuelan uh, government. That, that can make it harder for international lenders wanting to come to their aid. 
uh, last year, right before I taught the class, um, Russian airplanes landed um, in Caracas uh, uh, as a way to try to help provide assistance um, to maintain the current government um, in, uh, in power. We, you're going to see more in the video, but in large part because of the dependence uh, recently on oil production um, to the Venezuelan um, tax base. We saw in this, in this class economic production uh, is important um, both for uh, providing people jobs and security, but then also because of the tax base um, that this uh, income generates that you can redistribute to, to, um, to other parts of the population. Um, this was going well from 2004 to 2014 or so. However, you can see um, after 2014, with the uh, average price of, uh, of a barrel of oil, West Texas Intermediate is usually the benchmark um, um, uh, barrel of oil price. You saw it dr uh, dramatically drop in 2014. Um, and then uh, before then, during the 2008-2009 economic crisis, usually recessions, people don't drive as much, uh, they don't buy as much, and so you don't need as much oil. But just within the last year, I don't know how many of you were paying attention to oil prices a couple of months ago, uh, but briefly, um, oil futures reached negative territories. Um, because of the COVID crisis and the basic halt of a lot of economic activity, people didn't want to um, or didn't need uh, the oil. And so when the futures contracts were coming due, when you actually had to take possession of the oil, people didn't want to actually take possession of it. It was cheaper to pay other people to do so. It, recently, uh, it briefly reached negative territory, but now it's around 45 US dollars uh, per barrel, which is nowhere near the highs. Over $100 a barrel it was during uh, Hugo Chavez's um, great expansionist plans. You can see this graph um, without the gray bars with the recessions showing that dramatic decrease um, from 2014 to 2016, ticked up a little bit, um, but then has gone down quite dramatically even though it has rebounded in the last couple of months. This uh, has a direct effect on Venezuela as well, there, as well as other oil producing countries that we're gonna be talking about later on in the semester. Venezuela has the unenviable position as being the world's most miserable economy. I believe this is the sixth year that Venezuela has um, taken the crown as the number one most miserable economy as defined by the Bloomberg Misery Index. I tell you there's indices for everything, right? Um, the only two measures go into it, inflation and unemployment. Um, Venezuela's formal unemployment is is around 15%, though um, uh, unofficial claims would put that much higher. Inflation is what really drives it. Um, the most uh, least miserable would be Thailand in 2019. Um, Singapore and Japan um, would be there um, as well. Another way of measuring uh, change and just in a day-to-day -day how much things cost Having spent um, seven, eight years now in Australia, I have appreciated good coffee more than I did uh, coming from the land of Starbucks. And so one way of measuring uh, the, the real impact of inflation um, that might be a bit more visceral for you, uh, not necessarily the price of a loaf of bread or anything, but a, a cup of coffee. And so you can see from the Bloomberg's uh, Cafe Con Leche index um, that the price um, at an annualized uh, basis has gone up over 3,000% just in the last year. Um, I just checked uh, today, and the most recent price puts it at 290,000 bolivars, which is out of reach for a lot of people, um, given the difficulty of reaching hard currency, uh, getting hard currency within the country, and the, the pace of inflation. This is getting to the point in which all the kind of metrics of human security that you can think of have decreased into almost unimaginable uh, levels. A couple of press reports over the last couple of years. Um, people believe that um, thieves are stealing zoo animals just for something to eat. Um, soldiers have gone across the border to beg for food um, in Guyana. Econ um, um, electricity blackouts have become more, uh, more common. 
uh, malaria is is spreading again because um, the uh, uh, the the lack of air conditioning and lack of power, the lack of medical treatment uh, is making it worse. Um, and people are having to uh, branch out into areas that they might not have otherwise lived in order to be able to, to try to scrounge for food. Uh, political violence has also ticked up in areas short of conflict, um, murders, uh, protests, uh, uh, riots, uh, food riots and food protests um, have escalated. Uh, and some argue that it's at the risk of sliding into a civil war. And you could see in, in the video um, the, the political decisions that um, a lot of people have argued have led it to this point. And the one thing that uh, I'm interested in is to try to um, get you to think about what it might take for, for people to, to get to that point, right? And so I'll, I'll conclude today with my third lecture question um, that I would encourage you to answer on Waddle. Um, after watching, as you watch the video, um, I want you to think about this and then answer it in, uh, in Waddle. If Venezuela does slide into civil conflict, should it be attributed to, one, the political and economic decisions of the last two presidents, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, two, U.S. sanctions that made it difficult to be able to um, import um, goods uh, and medicines to the case, made it harder to sell Venezuelan oil. Three, the geography and geology of the state, the structural nature of the country and, and what it uh, depends on um, for its uh, economic growth or something else, um, something that you might know from your reading. I know a couple of uh, groups looked at Venezuela for the anocracy discussion last week. Or maybe other factors that you think might explain um, why it does slide in conflict or not. Um, because with a lot of the things we've looked at in this class, um, it can be easy to just focus like Homer Dixon does on the cases of conflict and try to explain what led a country to get uh, to that point. But it could be also interesting to see um, how similar factors um, are in different countries and, and one uh, type of country or one country goes one direction and another one goes the other. These are going to be topics we're going to be revisiting and what really triggers what, whether they're interactive effect uh, effects or short-term triggers or political decisions lead us to conflict. You can have uh, healthy debates about it. I think the bar, some of the bars have opened here. Hopefully some you can argue about this in, in, uh, at bars or cafes on your own time. Um, but this is the stuff of theorizing and thinking about the cases and to what extent theoretical explanations might travel from one country to another. So more on this uh, in the next couple of weeks in which we're looking at more specific types of um, uh, uh, climate, environment, and social factors and how they might lead to uh, increased or decreased security, however you might define it.